Hey everyone, so today for replication, I'm going to be using my special whiteboard. It's going to be great, uh, and I'll be doing lots of little jump cuts in here. I'm going to speed things up just so you can kind of see what's going on. But I like to draw replication because uh, there are some really good videos, and I will definitely post those. Uh, but I also want to just kind of sort of hand animate what's going on so that we can get into the nitty gritty of what's really going on with DNA replication. Now I'm going to be focusing from the perspective of uh, a bacterial DNA replication because it's slightly simpler, but all of these same enzymes and stuff exist in eukaryotic organisms. Uh, there's just usually a few more or they have extra components or um, will have something, uh, the, the DNA replication in, in eukaryotes can get a little more complicated because there's just so much more DNA, there's some more fact checking that can go on. And so uh, it gets a little more complicated, but honestly, for the most part, we're just gonna focus on bacteria because that's all we really need to worry about. So first, let's draw our DNA strand. Okay, so We've got our double helix here. We have our top and our bottom strand. Okay, I just drew one single connection here, but that's actually two nucleotides attached with hydrogen bonds. So if you have an A and then there's a T, there's two hydrogen bonds. And if you have a C and a G, there's three hydrogen bonds. Okay, that was last lecture where we talked a little bit more about DNA's actual structure. So that's gonna come into play because well, we need to deal with that structure as we actually take things apart. So what we wanna do with replication is we need to take each of these strands, pull them apart and separate them. And then we're going to build a new strand and make a new double strand, okay? So let's do that. So in order to do that, we're gonna to have to use some special enzymes to actually do that. So there are a few that I wanna hit and I'm gonna separate this out into basically three steps. Okay, for replication. The first step is actually opening up the DNA helix. Now we're going to kind of assume that this is wrapped up right now and so we need to unwrap it and we need to separate those hydrogen bonds and separate our two strands from each other. Okay? The enzyme that's going to do that is called helicase. It's going to unzip our double helix. Okay, So we're going to use helicase for this. We're going to use some single stranded binding proteins, okay? Single stranded binding proteins. Those are going to provide a scaffolding to uh, just kind of support the separation of the strands. DNA as a double helix is relatively stable. Uh, it's one of the most stable molecules that we see in nature. And so when we're actually pulling these two strands apart, we're drastically reducing that stability. And so we're going to use single-stranded binding proteins to maintain that stability, at least until we're done with replication. So we have our helicase, and we have our single-stranded binding proteins, and then we're also going to use a special enzyme called topo isomerase. Now, that is the eukaryotic term. Uh, that's kind of the better term as an enzyme. You will also see it labeled gyrase. So if you're doing bacterial replication, you'll see it listed as DNA gyrase. It's the same thing. Okay? There are different versions of this. I'm glossing over a few of the details. Um, there are multiple topoisomerases. There are multiple DNA polymerases. And we're just going to touch on a few of the biggies, okay? So these are the three enzymes that we're going to use, okay? So let's get to it. Okay, so you can see I have started to erase this part of my DNA double helix here. And what we're going to do is we're going to go in two directions. We're going to focus on one direction for the time being. So our helicase is going to come in here and we're going to draw it. There's our helicase, okay. And our helicase is going to come over here and it's going to unzip. That's usually the term of use. It's going to unzip these nucleotides, okay. So I'm going to draw my backbone. And there's my nucleotides that used to be attached. Okay, so those would match up. And my helicase is going to go this way. So we're going to open it up. We're going to unzip. It looks kind of like a zipper. We're going to unzip our zipper this way. Okay, that's the job of helicase. So as it's unzipping, we're going to open up 
this, and as we keep progressing, we're going to do a little hand animation here. Okay. It's going to open up, okay. and as it keeps going, this just opens up more and more and more. Okay. So that's helicase's job. So helicase is kind of moving along here. There's our helicase. It keeps moving, and it keeps opening up that double helix. Okay. So that's helicase's job. Now, as you're doing that, now let me grab a different color here, just a second. As we're doing that, we're going to be attaching some single-stranded binding proteins just to give ourselves some stability. Now, you'll notice that I, I'm just keeping this one. I don't want to erase it and redraw it, but it would really kind of bulge out a little bit too. Okay. Just for the sake of what we're doing now, we're going to keep it like this, okay? So those single-stranded binding proteins, they're just going to give us a little bit of support, okay? That's the only reason that they're there. Now, something really interesting that happens. When you have a double helix, it's wrapped around, right? And it's coiled, okay? We're assuming it's ZDNA, or BDNA, I'm sorry. So we're assuming it's BDNA, we're at uncoiling that. And what happens when you uncoil a helix is that it can get kind of knotted up. Okay, so if something's really wrapped up and I try to open it up, it's going to get knotted. Okay, I have an example for you. So the way I like to demonstrate DNA replication and the what helicase actually does to the double strand is I like to use a rubber band. Okay, so I've got a rubber band here, and I'm going to twist it around so you can see I'm getting some twists, and this is going to look like our DNA helix. So it's kind of just the twists that we see in our DNA helix. So you can see it's kind of twisted around there. Okay. It's a little, a little tangly. Ow. Okay. All right. So we've got our double helix. You can see it's just all bunched up. And so what's going to happen is uh, we're going to use our helicase and we're going to use our helicase to try and open up the strand. I don't usually use this thick of rubber band. Okay, so we're going to open up a little hole there. Okay, so I'm going to put my finger in there. So this is where we actually have our helicase initiating replication. Okay, and so it's going to open it up in, uh, we're going to have two helicases going in each direction, but we're just going to follow one direction for now. And so our helicase is going to open it up and it's going to start pushing this way. And I want you to just watch what's happening. Okay, so it's going to push, it's opening up, which is great. So we, it actually really looks like this. And then as I get closer and closer to this end, you can see what's happening. All the knots that were, uh, all the twists and turns that were in here are now being slid to this end. And you get what uh, we call super coiling. Super coiling, uh, we can take advantage of that uh, if we want it to happen, but in this case, we don't want super coiling to happen. What super coiling can do is it prevents, uh, it just basically forms a knot and then uh, you can't do anything once your DNA is all twisted up and knotty. DNA can get really sticky. It's just an interesting uh, molecule. And so when this actually happens, that's really bad. And so that's where topoisomerase comes in. So let's just jump back to the chart, okay? We're back. So our helicase is opening that up, but we're getting all of these twists in here. And so that's the job of topoisomerase. So a topoisomerase is going to fix our topoisomer. And so what's going to happen is we're going to have our topoisomerase come here. I'm going to draw it in red. And remember, we're getting all of these like twists and knots and stuff showing up. And what it's going to do is it's going to cut the DNA and let it kind of unzip. So you cut it and go, and then it's going to re-ligate. And then that allows that torsion, okay, uh, to be relieved. And so when you get that super coiling, all that torsion, all that tension, it relieves that tension. Okay, so that's the job of topoisomerase is to relieve that torsional tension that occurs during the unzipping of your DNA double helix. So, but this is pretty straightforward, right? So, this step one of the three steps, where you're going to use helicase to open this strand up we're going to use our single-stranded binding proteins to maintain the integrity of the DNA while we're replicating. And we're going to use the topoisomerase to relieve some of that tension. Okay. So let's cut to a new DNA strand so that I can show you the next step.
Okay, so it looks like a giant gobbly monster dude, but this is just one side of that double strand that we just opened up, okay? So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to start labeling my carbons, okay? Because we know uh, in the last video I talked about the uh, nomenclature that we actually use for our strands. So we have our five prime carbon, and thus this end of this strand would have our three prime carbon. So this one would have our three prime on this strand, and thus this would have our five prime carbon. Now we always build from five to three. Okay? So when we add new nucleotides, that's what we're going to do. Now, that's really cool because it's going to allow us to actually do two directions at once, but there's some tricks to that. So we're going to talk about that right now. Okay. So now we're moving on to step two, which we're going to assume that helicase is still here and opening it up and that topoisomerase is doing its job and it's actually fixing that torsion. Okay. That's kind of happening simultaneously. We're just going to assume that. I'm not going to draw it because honestly it gets a little busy. And so we're just going to try and simplify things. Now, we're going to talk about DNA polymerase 3. Okay? So our enzyme now is DNA, because we're making DNA, polymer, A's for enzyme. So DNA, that A is terrible, DNA polymer A's, okay? DNA polymerase. And so it's going to be the enzyme that's going to make new polymers of DNA. That's its job. Okay? It's going to take nucleotides, either A's or T's or C's or G's. Uh, those are floating around. They're just available to be used. And it's going to use those and incorporate them into the new strand. But the trick here, it needs to know where to start. Okay? That's another enzyme's job. That is the job of primase. The job of primase is to actually take a little piece of RNA, because that's easier to get rid of. It's going to take a little piece of RNA and use that as uh, the starting point. Okay? It's the starting line for the DNA polymerase to actually begin. Okay? So those are the two things we have. DNA polymerase, okay? that's going to actually do most of the work. Uh, in the, this case, uh, we're in a bacteria and DNA polymerase 3, 1, 2, 3, that is the main polymerase that's going to be doing the work, okay? Um, and then we've also got our primase, okay? Cool. So let's get rid of these and do some animating. Okay, so in red, I'm going to put my use my primase to actually put my primer on there. Now remember, we're always building from 5 to 3, so I need to make sure I know what's going on. So uh, this strand goes from 3 to 5, and so my new strand is going to be built from 5 to 3 on this new bottom one. Remember, we're building two new DNA strands. We're going to have one here to match up with this guy, and we're going to have another strand here to match up with this one. Okay, And so we're going to build from 5 prime to 3 prime. So this new strand, we're going to work on the bottom one down here. So my primase, I'm not going to draw the primase, I'm just going to draw what it will do, okay? So the primase is going to come along, my hand's going to be the primase, and it's going to stick on a little RNA primer. We'll make it three nucleotides long, okay? We've got our little RNA primer right here, okay? and our RNA primer, it's RNA is very, very similar to DNA, we've talked about that, in that it's... It's almost identical except for like what one extra carbon on like two things, okay, or in like a hydroxyl group, and so uh, it's going to look exactly the same. the The backbone is the same, and so we're going to have a five prime, okay, because we're now we're just focusing on this strand down here. So if this goes from three to five, this one is going to go from five to three prime. Pretty straightforward. So as I've been saying over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. You build from five to three. So we're going to build in this direction. Okay. So now our primer, that's this, and we do this artificially as well. And so when we do PCR, so in the lab portion of this class, you'll be doing PCR. It's a digital lab, but you're actually going to basically be using the exact same machine that I used in grad school. And you're going to use a primer to do this exact thing. So we just can artificially do that in a petri dish, but uh, in every one of your cells, you also do that. You also use an RNA primer to 
put that little primer down there and initiate replication. Um, in the case of PCR, we use a little DNA primer. It's fine, it's just because it's more stable. It's the only reason we do that. So in blue is going to be our new strand that our DNA polymerase is gonna use. So uh, let's pretend this eraser is our DNA polymerase. So it comes along and it encounters the primer and that tells the DNA polymerase three that it needs to begin replication, <laughs> putting new nucleotides down, okay? Now, these are not RNAs. This was RNA, okay? Primase puts the RNA down. These are pieces of DNA. So it's going to start building new chunks of DNA. Notice we're building in five to three prime direction. All right. So it's going to just keep on chugging. Okay. So we've done it. Uh, this is the lagging strand, and I want to talk about what that means. But first, we need to talk about the other side. Okay. So you'll hear those terms thrown around a lot leading versus lagging strands. Okay, that's something I'm going to ask you about on the exam. So if we're, let's start building this guy too, okay? So we've got our five prime to three prime, so that would mean this would be our five prime to three prime direction, okay? So my primase has added another primer, and my DNA polymerase is going to start building another set of nucleotides. We're building another DNA strand. Okay. Now, I have reached the limit, so if my uh, DNA helix isn't unzipped here, you're just kind of stuck. And that's what happens if you don't have your topoisomerase relieving that tension, then the helicase ends up running into those little knots and just can't keep going. Uh, and that's not good. Uh, that's actually how we kill a lot of bacteria. Uh, we can use um, antibiotics that will kill topoisomerase or DNA gyrase. Uh, like the fluoroquinolones and the quinolone class of antibiotics will disable topoisomerases. And so that's really, really good at killing bacteria because then when they actually go to replicate their genomes, they can't do anything. And it's, it's so damaging that they actually end up dying. Uh, so really, really powerful class of antibiotics. Now, so we're, we're reaching this fork here, right? So what do we do? Well, let's assume that our helicase and our topoisomerase are doing their thing. I'm gonna kind of redraw this. So let's let's draw it as if it has now uh, sort of opened back up. So I'm gonna draw this out a little more expanded here. It's still five prime. Okay. And I'm just gonna redraw my nucleotides here. Okay, so we're gonna build our new strand. So I'll stop about where we were. Okay, so let's say we stopped right there. So we've opened up the rest of our strand, okay? and I don't need a new primer, right? Because the strand opened up, the DNA polymerase is just kind of waiting for the strand to open up and it says, all right, well, it's already initiated. I'm just gonna keep on chugging. Awesome, building five to three. Okay. Now it's gonna keep going, okay? And it'll just keep going in perpetuity. Uh, this is called the leading strand because it never stops, okay? As long as I initiate it with one primer, it's going to progress continually as we go this direction. Okay. Now, the trick is with this bottom one here. So I started this with a primer, it's gonna keep going. So at the other replication fork, which I will draw a better example of this, uh, at the other replication fork, this would be the leading strand. So I probably don't even have to draw it. So you can imagine um, these strands are gonna come back kind of like this and come back together. And so they're going to have to open up as well. And so when those actually open up, this strand is just gonna keep on cruising, just like this one, okay? So when you hear leading strand versus lagging strand, what you need to think about is that DNA replicates in two different directions, right? In two opposite directions. In one, each direction has a leading strand and each direction has a lagging strand, okay? So hopefully that's pretty straightforward. And when they meet on the other side, then you're you're done, you just have two new strands. But one was being built leading, and one is being built lagging until they meet up with their opposite leading and lagging strand. Okay. Hopefully that's pretty straightforward, okay? That looks super weird, I apologize. So, what do we do down here though, okay? So we've got our le leading strand here, it's being built, five prime to three prime. Okay, awesome. Um, now down here, the problem with this is it's opened up this way, right? It's opened up this way, so I pulled this down, and 
I build five prime to three prime, right? So I had to start on this end of my primer. I can't go this way. You just can't. And so I would have to put a new primer on. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. Our primase comes over. Okay. There, I'm gonna draw our new primer. Oh, I'll make it three degrees. That's about it. So there's my new primer. Okay, I'm gonna draw five prime to three prime, just to be consistent. So five prime to three. And then my DNA polymerase is going to have to find its new spot here and it's going to fill in that gap. Okay, So that is the lagging strand because every time this opens up, I have to put down a new primer and then have my DNA polymerase start again on that primer. Now that feels a little um, inefficient. That's just how it works. It's honestly the most efficient way to do it. Um, so that's the basic idea behind leading strands where they just are continuous and lagging strands or discontinuous. Okay? Those are also terms that get used. So step three is we're going to use the same diagram to talk about the third step of replication. Now in re the third step of replication, what we need to do is uh, remember that these primers are RNA, right? So these are RNA primers. We don't want RNA in our DNA. That's kind of silly. It's not going to work. It's just going to be strange. Things aren't going to work, right? So we need to use a different DNA polymerase. Okay. So we're going to use DNA polymerase, polymerase one. Okay, so DNA polymerase one is a different DNA polymerase. Okay. It's going to come along and it's going to do two things. Okay. And this is where some confusion actually comes up in uh, some of the videos that I've seen online. And that's why I wanted to address it this way. So my DNA polymerase has two different activities. Okay. Something that we're going to learn if you take biochemistry, uh, and I'm mentioning it here, is that uh, enzymes can have multiple functionalities. Enzymes can be massive, multifunctional, uh, quaternary structured proteins. And so we can take advantage of that. So instead of having two, three, four different enzymes to each do separate jobs, we can have one enzyme that could do two, even three or four. And so that just cuts out uh, a lot of the extraneous work and lets us be more efficient. Because, I mean, I've got my DNA polymerase, so it's going to act like a DNA polymerase. It's going to build new nucleotides. But it also has a separate activity. Okay, it's called exonuclease activity is how it's usually referred to. Okay, now exonuclease activity is uh, when you see an exonuclease, that's when you're destroying nucleotides. Okay, in this case, we're destroying RNA, and we do that usually in the opposite direction. So if I usually build from five prime to three prime, my exonuclease activity will be from three prime to five prime. Now it depends on the polymerase, it can get really complicated, but I'm not super interested in that. All I really care about is the idea that DNA pol one or DNA polymerase one is going to get rid of your RNA. Okay. That's the exonuclease activity. And then it's going to build, I'm actually gonna use black for this, it's gonna build a new set of DNA strands to fill in where it eliminated that RNA primer. Okay, So that's our third step. Okay, So our third step is eliminating these primers and replacing them with DNA, since they were RNA. Because we don't want RNA in our DNA. It's not as stable. It's going to confuse other machinery. It's going to confuse um, transcription machinery. It's just a bad idea to do that. Um, we need it to be DNA so that we can do other things to it. The very last thing I wanted to mention though, we have one more enzyme. So if we have our DNA polymerase one, it's going to replace, using its exonuclease activity, it's gonna replace our primers with DNA. We're left with a little gap here, okay, between where the primer was and where our new DNA strand is. And so what we need to do is use another enzyme called Ligase. Okay. Ligase. So ligase, it ligates is the term that we use when we rebuild that uh, bond in the backbone. 
Okay? So when we ligate, we're going to ligate the bond. Okay? And so we're just reforming that new bond. The reason we bring up ligase is because we can use ligase in the lab often. So uh, we can use that to, uh, let's say you had a plasmid, which is just a circular piece of DNA, and you can cut it out at specific locations using restriction enzymes, and you cut out those specific locations and pull out that chunk of DNA you don't want, put in a new one that you do want, and then you use ligase to reattach those bonds in the backbone so that it's now a completely solid primer. That's how you primer plasmid. Uh, so that's where ligase comes in. Now, something that uh, is a little bit confusing to some people is that um, all of this is occurring sort of at once and it gets a little scary looking. So I'm gonna to cut to a picture of what that actually looks like. And here is our complex. So this is our replicon, it would be one term for it, but it's just the replication complex that exists at each replication fork. So there would be two of these. Uh, this is something that gets glossed over in a lot of descriptions of uh, DNA replication. And so what it, the important part here is this clamp loader. It's just the scaffolding along with the beta clamps that sort of keep it in place, uh, or sliding clamps, they're also called. Uh, this is the scaffolding that we attach our DNA Pol3, uh, our polymerase 3, our helicase, and our primase 2 to allow this entire thing to uh, progress towards this replication fork. And so it's really cool. So instead of having these enzymes rely on just randomly encountering the place where they're needed, no, we just have them kind of all there ready to go, which makes a lot of sense. Now we do see some crossover between different creatures, okay? So uh, in uh, bacteria, we generally use DNA polymerase 3. That's the one that's gonna be do most of the uh, elongation. Uh, but in eukaryotes, uh, I mentioned earlier that we do see some differences and uh, it's more complex as you enter more complex creatures. And so uh, in eukaryotes, uh, the job of leading and lighting strand synthesis actually falls to two separate polymerases. Uh, it falls to delta, that's lowercase delta, and epsilon, that's lowercase epsilon. Uh, delta is responsible for the lagging strand, and epsilon is responsible for the leading strand. And so you can just sort of replace them uh, depending. So there's the lagging strand, so this would be a delta, and this would be the epsilon over here because it's the leading strand. Uh, not terribly important, at least as far as this class is concerned, but it is important to show you that uh, things do get more complex as things, uh, as creatures get more complex, um, and that there is a lot of similarity. There's a lot of mimicry that occurs uh, in this system. It's such an important system that we see the consistency of these enzymes uh, across whole sets of creatures. Um, and uh, we even see that if we go even farther back, so these are bacteriophages, uh, so T4 and T7 bacteriophages, so those are viruses that actually infect bacteria, and we see some similarities. They, um, not all viruses encode for DNA polymerases, but these ones happen to, and they're very, very similar. They still have similar functionality that we see in these higher order organisms, which is really, really interesting. So a few other points that I wanna hammer home in our slide set is the idea of the leading and lagging strand. This is really, really important, okay? So if I have my five prime to three prime strand here and my five prime to three prime strand here, so when I actually construct my leading strand, let's look at this replication fork, as I'm building from five prime to three prime, as I open this up, this will just open up wider and this three prime end will just continue to be built, okay? That's the leading strand for this direction. So we're gonna have a leading strand for this direction as well. As this opens up, I can just keep on going. Now the lagging strand, as this opens up, I have to keep adding these little chunks, okay? Now we talked a little bit about uh, those little pieces of RNA, and those are going to get um, exonucleated or uh, destroyed by DNA Pol 1, and uh, we remove it, and then we replace it, and then they get ligated to fix those strands. Now, that's exonuclease activity uh, to actually remove those nucleotides, uh, the RNA nucleotides, uh, but there's another type of exonuclease activity that I wanted to talk about, and that's the proofreading exonuclease activity. So all DNA polymerases in bacteria actually possess a proofreading exonuclease activity, and what that means is DNA polymerases can make mistakes. So they're supposed to, uh, for example, in this case, uh, it was a T, so they added an A, G, C, A, T, T, A, C, G, C, 
A, that's wrong. It should be a G here. It should be a guanine, not an adenine. And if that does happen, it, hey, it happens. You know what? You accidentally grab the wrong nucleotide and stick it on there. It doesn't usually happen, but it does sometimes. And so uh, bacterial polymerases and the main eukaryotic polymerases, right? so our leading epsilon and our lagging strand uh, delta, do have proofreading activity. And what that means is they can go backwards and they will fact check what they're doing and they will go backwards and remove, i.e. use exonuclease activity, uh, in the opposite direction. So normally we build from five prime to three prime, okay? Now, when we do exonuclease activity, in this case, it's three to five prime exonuclease activity. It's going backwards just a little bit and it can put that new nucleotide in and it puts that guanine in and that's what's supposed to happen. Now, that's really, really helpful. It lowers the amount of mutations that can accidentally get engendered into DNA, which is really, really good because mutations, especially for organisms that are really complex like us, can be really, really bad. Um, if you have uh, a mutation in your, um, one example I know of is in colon cancer. If you have a mutation in this proofreading activity, uh, you can uh, more likely develop colon cancers. And so that's really, really bad, of course, because you don't want to get cancer. Now, the other side of that, the flip coin, is that a lot of viral polymerases, uh, if they have DNA polymerase activity, don't have this ability. And so they're not preventing these mutations from happening. But if you're a virus, it's all about numbers. And if you apply a selective pressure onto a virus, so uh, some kind of immune response, or um, uh, that's what I can think of, like an antibody, or uh, cells have intracellular immune responses, um, you can drive with that selective pressure, you can drive the natural selection of viruses that have mutations in the proteins in the DNA and thus the proteins uh, that can resist those um, selective pressures. Uh, we see this in HIV all the time. Um, HIV has a, it's a reverse transcriptase, which um, has two different activities. It has an RNA polymerase ability, uh, an RNA to a DNA polymerase ability, and a DNA to DNA polymerase ability. And it does not do proofreading and it makes mistakes all the time. It puts these point mutations in constantly. And we're gonna spend a whole section on mutations and then we're going to spend a whole another section on mutation repair so this is going to come back up we'll talk about this again but uh, when we see that in hiv if you put a patient on one single hiv drug eventually over time it actually doesn't take that long a couple months um, so many new hiv viruses are built that have mutations that will allow them to resist those drugs and so that selective pressure of those drugs drives natural selection because of the lack of that proofreading ability. Really, really interesting. What I wanted to talk about was why do we call it semi-conservative replication? That's the term that gets used. And so when you, when you hear about DNA replication, you'll hear that it's semi-conservative. And when you understand, let me back up a little bit, when you understand uh, how this is created, so we know that we take, uh, we have two original strands, right, in dark blue here, and we take one of them and tack on a new strand, right? So in the light blue here. So we have a dark blue original with a new light blue, and we have another dark blue original with a new light blue. So the conservation of that original dark blue strand, it's semi-conserved. So we don't take, uh, uh, let's say, assume one way we could do it is if we took this dark blue, made a new strand, took this dark blue, made the other strand, and then took these new light blue strands and stuck those two together, and then took those original dark two dark blues and stuck them back together. Uh, which, the way we understand this, it doesn't really make sense, but we didn't know that for a long time. And so it's semi-conserved. Every new daughter strand okay, has one from the original and one fresh brand new one. That's semi-conservative, okay? So when I have my parent, after my cycles of replication, uh, this is assuming that you labeled it radioactively, like let's say it's radioactively red here. And so as you actually go down deeper into uh, replication cycles, you end up with uh, semi-conserved. So you have one dark blue here and one red, and then those are gonna be passed on. And eventually it kind of dilutes out um, as you go deeper and deeper. Now, there were other models proposed. Uh, the conservative model would be what I just described, where um, you sort of put them back together. So I have my parental strain, I make a new one off of it, and then I keep those strands stuck together. But that's obviously not how it works. Uh, 
Um, the dispersive model is sort of similar to this one, the semi-conservative, except that it's just sort of random. And so the original strand chunks are just randomly incorporated, uh, but that doesn't really work either. That would require so much more effort, uh, as would the conservative model. And so that's why uh, we call this semi-conservative replication. Big topic I want to talk about are how do we know where we're supposed to start replication? It's a really good question. And so uh, in bacteria, what we see, I know this is a really busy diagram that I got from this uh, really nice uh, paper actually. Um, so bear with me. Uh, in bacteria, there's usually one to two conserved DNA sequences. So that means when we actually look in the genome, we see that those pieces of DNA stay, uh, they're conserved, they're consistent. And uh, that's, it can be a few more for archaea, but we're sticking with bacteria here. And there's only one to two conserved sequences, and those are the uh, ORICs, or the origin of replication. Okay? And so that's the term that we use as the origin of replication. And in bacteria, we see a, just a couple of those. And they're the place where the machinery that we've been talking about this whole time, all of these enzymes, can actually enter into that double strand and start, or at least be able to get ready to start replication. Um, it's very similar in yeast. Uh, yeast are eukaryotes, but uh, the way that they actually do their origins of replication is uh, kind of in between how other eukaryotic organisms and bacteria do it. So you have this ORIC, ORIC and it's in uh, the origin binding uh, location. That DNA sequence is consistent. Uh, in bacteria, it tends to have a lot of uh, thymines and adenines uh, for whatever reason, and uh, probably because it's easier to open up because uh, there's only two hydrogen bonds between A's and T's, and there are three between G's and C's. So if you have a lot of A's and T's, it's a little easier to open. And so you open that up and you stick in your helicase uh, along with other stuff. And you can see eventually we end up with the entire replisome, um, the, the replicon here of all the, there's our clamp and our loader and our polymerases. And eventually you get to that point. And uh, in uh, yeast, it's more complicated. There's a lot more going on. Uh, that's kind of why I put this on here, just to show <laughs> the jump from bacteria to yeast is massive in the amount of just proteins that are hanging out and doing stuff. Um, yeah, it gets complicated. But in higher order organisms, so including uh, uh, yeast, uh, other eukaryotes as well, especially humans, there's not one or two conserved regions. There's thousands to tens of thousands. So humans, it's estimated, it's kind of hard to find sometimes uh, between 30 and 50,000 origins of replication, but that makes sense. We have a bunch of huge, gigantic chromosomes and we have uh, up to, it depends on how you're looking at them, but 20,000-ish genes, just genes. And those can be massive genes and really, really long. And so if you wanna replicate an entire cell's genome, you're going to need a lot of uh, replication machinery and you're going to need to enter into those uh, DNA strands in a ton of places if you're going to get it done any time this century. And so, and our cells replicate really, really fast, right? So just think about the scale that we're talking about. This is really small, but there are a ton of these origins of replication, uh, which is really, really interesting. Creatures like us that aren't yeast, uh, so basically any other higher order eukaryote, it's not as well understood uh, where our actual origins are. That's why 30 to 50,000, that's a huge range, right? And so it's actually poorly understood uh, what actually constitutes a location for being able to actually initiate replication. Um, and so I wanna talk a little bit about that and uh, just some of the, the terms of use. And so uh, uh, this is the same point here that there are 30 to 50,000 origins of replication in uh, humans, at least. And a bunch of these are licensed. So there's a couple terms that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about um, licensing, and I'm going to talk about firing. Okay. So if you license an origin of replication, what that means is that you just put a helicase in there, or the machinery that will help bring the helicase into that location. So that means that origin of replication is now licensed. So it could initiate replication at that point, but only about 20% of those are. So, and when they actually uh, start initiating that replication from that location, uh, we call it being fired. Let me italicize that, it's being fired. 
and only about 20% of them are, okay? So one out of five are actually licensed, or uh, the, of the licensed ones are actually fired. And where we see that come into play, if you actually study different creatures and you can kind of zoom in on different, uh, the simpler creatures than humans, and uh, we can see that uh, sometimes if you need to uh, call more of them up, if you need to fire more of them, because for whatever reason you're, it's kind of slow on one of the chromosomes, or one of your helicases is broke, then you can jump into uh, a, a different licensed origin and fire it. And so you can sort of save the day that way. And uh, what they're just trying to show here, that's a really interesting paper if you'd like to look at it. Uh, the link is uh, will be down below in the slides. Uh, in most creatures, you're going to want access licensed origins. Okay, You're kind of giving yourself a safety net. If you don't do that and something bad happens, so let's say your helicase got broken for whatever reason, I mean things break all the time, they're little machines, uh, you're just kind of screwed. There's nothing you can do about that. Okay, So you're just messed up and uh, you're not going to replicate and you're probably going to die because it gets stuck and it's broken and then your cell just doesn't know what to do with it. Now if you have access licensed origins, well that makes a lot of sense because then if something breaks, you can go on to fix it because you can go back around, you can have uh, these extra licensed ones fired and they can sort of fix the problem. And so that's usually what you're going to want. Uh, and what I want to point out here, and I'm going to talk more about that in the next slide as well, uh, G1 and S. So that's referring to G1, S, G2, and then mitosis, or the M phase of the cell cycle, which is the next topic that we're going to be talking about in this class. The last thing I wanted to mention uh, to sort of prime us for that as well, uh, so we've got G1 here, right? So that's before we enter the S phase. We're going to talk about the different checkpoints involved, and how does a cell actually decide to double itself, to uh, undergo replication and mitosis and make a daughter cell? It's a really, really good question. We're going to talk about all of the signaling proteins that actually are involved. And uh, one of the big ones that you're going to see is CDK here. And then there's another one here that uh, we'll talk a little bit about maybe is uh, DDK. So it's <laughs> uh, welcome to... <laughs> biochemistry slash molecular biology where everything's named weird and <laughs> this is called dumbbell f4 dependent kinase so that's what the dbf stands for um, or just ddk it's just a, a kinase is something that phosphorylates and so it adds phosphates to things and it's one of the proteins that's associated with the cell cycle and so how do i actually get my cell to replicate well it's uh, sort of related to uh, those uh, these origins of replication that we've been talking about. So if I uh, want to enter and replicate my DNA, well, what steps do I have to follow to actually get that first? Well, it depends on what phase of the cell cycle you're in. So in the G1 phase, let's say we actually get to the G1 phase, we exit the G0 phase and enter the G1 phase, and the presence of DDK, which is blah, 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 dependent kinase, that allows the initial loading of helicases into the origins of replication. Okay, that kind of makes sense. So when it's early on, I haven't actually started doing my replication, but I'm getting ready for it. Okay, I'm going to fill my little um, origins and I'm going to license them. However, I don't want to necessarily in, uh, fire them all off yet. And so what I look at now is uh, I can move on. So I'm, I get different proteins and they start building up. And we're going to talk more about this later. Uh, I get the, the presence of cyclin-dependent kinase, so cyclin having to do with the cell cycle, uh, the cell cycle, and so in this case it's a cyclin, which is another protein, a cyclin-dependent kinase, and that's going to initiate this, and the cyclin-dependent kinase suppresses or kind of turns off this loading. So I'm not putting helicases in the origins of replication anymore if CDK is present, which is really interesting. So it's got this negative feedback mechanism in addition to a positive feedback mechanism for actually creating the pre-initiation complex, which is what we call the replicon or uh, the DNA polymerase with the clamp loader and all that crazy stuff. Um, that's the actual, the pre-initiation of replication complex. Okay, so that's what they're calling the pre-IC here. If you're a nerd, that's what you call it. And that's really interesting. So the cyclin dependent kinase turns off these origins because they're like, hey, we're done with that. Let's move on. And it actually allows us to progress to the next step. When uh, we actually talk about the cell cycle, it's going to be really interesting. We're going to see CDK again. We're going to see cyclins. There's more than one. It's going to be really great. So stay tuned.